I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Let's stand together as we sing this hymn, How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout thy universe. Go right into the second verse. When through the woods and forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur And hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sing. My soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art.
Amen. In John 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This next song that we're going to sing, the last line of the first verse says, There is only one salvation. Jesus went on to say in verse 6, I, talking about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me.
to do something real quick. We just sang the chorus of that song that said, we believe, we believe, we believe. Ms. Gayla, will you back up to the chorus? Here's what needs to happen. It's easy to say we believe corporately like this. This morning, I'm going to challenge you. We're fixing to re-sing this chorus. We're going to change the words. Cooper Jernigan made a choice a, few, a little while ago said, I believe. Can you sing that chorus saying, I believe that? Because it's easy to get lost in the crowd and just kind of go along with it. But when you change the word says, I believe, you either have to look deep down inside of you and say, yes, Lord, I believe in you, or I'm about to sing a lie to you. Do you truly believe that? Because, y'all, if we believe that, our lives reflect that. So I'm not sure how we're fixing to do this, because needless to say, we didn't practice this. <laughs> but we're fixing to try and sing through the course of this, and I want to change the words we to I. I want to challenge you to make this personal as we sing through this chorus real quick. We believe in God the Father. Make it for you. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. I believe in the crucifixion. I believe pray that that thought that I believe that comes out of every ounce of you in the next moments as we sing. It's a new song. <laughs> if your life is not in tune, it should be.
just a moment. In 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, God's Word says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except for the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? As we're worshiping, if you want to stand, stand. If you want to remain seated, you just worship the Lord and, and lift your voice to Him this morning.
Apostle Paul gave us a word in Philippians 1.21. He said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The victories come when God is glorified the most, no matter what happens to us. Victory is not about our personal achievements. Our personal achievements, achievements mean nothing in the end. True victory is found in Christ and in the sharing of his sufferings. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must believe. Before Brother John comes, let's just sing this hymn together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Here in the power of Christ. 
Father, we do stand in you alone because we know that in you alone is our salvation. In you alone is the power we need for life. In you alone is all that we need to live our lives. And so, Father, we stand in you alone. We thank you for this time of worship, this time of, that gave us the opportunity to express to you our gratitude for all that you are. And Lord, we don't even worry about all that you do. Just who you are is worthy of our worship. And Lord, we know that you speak to us as well, even as we worship and as we study your word. And I pray that you'd, you'd do that now as we try to learn from your word how to better reflect Christ through our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a cult is a group of people <clears throat> who either by declaration or practice say that they are a religious body. Uh, in other words, uh, there may be a bunch of folks that Every time there's a full moon, uh, they, they find some roosters and slit their throats and say that that is a worship practice. Or there may be other folks who have buildings like we do and gather on a regular basis and maybe even use the, the Bible that we do and say that they follow God. But in reality, when you dig down into what their belief system is, you discover that they're really far from it. One religious researcher estimates, estimates that there are about 6,000 religions and cults that are functioning in the United States today. Did you, get, did you hear that number? I didn't, I didn't stutter, did I? Uh, about 6,000 groups or sects or cults practicing in the United States today. Now, there are a lot of scholars and reporters who don't like to use the word cult uh, because it's not PC. It's not politically correct to label people as such. So they often use the phrase religious movement when really what they are describing is a cult. But God is not so much interested in us being PC, politically correct, as he is in us being BC, biblically correct. So whether you call it a cult or a religious movement, it's always important to evaluate whatever group it is in light of what God's word teaches. And there's truth and there is falsehood. There is right and there is wrong. God's word is both true and right. And so it becomes the standard by which we uh, grade everything else. Anything that is contrary to God's word is both false and wrong. The Bible is a standard. And it helps us to separate false uh, from fact. Now, there was a spiritual scam taking place in the early church. So it's not something new. Been going on ever since the beginning. It was called Gnosticism. And this word Gnostic basically means knowledge. And there are several words that we use commonly in our vocabulary today that have the same re uh, root word as the word Gnostic. Uh, for example, uh, we use the word agnostic. And that simply means without knowledge. An agnostic doesn't know. And he admits that. I don't know that there is a God. I don't know that there isn't. So uh, an agnostic is without knowledge. A prognosis comes from the same root word. Prognosis means before you know, before knowledge. So what is the prognosis? Well, we think this is going to happen. We don't know. We don't know. But this is what we think is the way it's going to play out. 
Another word uh, that comes from this same root word as Gnostic is diagnosis. Diagnosis. And that means with knowledge. So the diagnosis is this. This is what we've discovered. This is what we know about the situation. So the Gnostics that John was addressing in his letter uh, doubted the deity of Jesus. They said, well, I I'm not sure that uh, he is who he said he was. Um, so they didn't believe that he was deity. But they also didn't believe that he was fully human. They doubted the humanity of Jesus as well. So John addresses in this letter those who were doubting who Jesus was, those Gnostics who had infiltrated the church. John's word that confront the false teachers of the first century are still relevant today because they are still those in the 21st century who are teaching the same kinds of falsehoods that were being taught in the first century. God's word never gets old. It, is a, it applies to every generation, and it still applies to us today. Our passage for today is in 1 John chapter 4, and we are continuing in through uh, the book, the letter of 1 John. It's the January Bible study this year, and uh, the January Bible study is um, uh, based on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, we have a little study book. <clears throat> if you hadn't picked one up yet and you'd like one, there's some out here at the sign-up center, so you can go by there and get you one of the little study books that will help you to understand uh, what John is teaching. So as we go through our passage this morning, I'm going to give you four key words that can help you to evaluate any teaching uh, against what God's Word tells us. So if you want, if you want to evaluate uh, this group or evaluate what this, this uh, body is teaching, uh, these four words will help you to do that. Uh, and when you hear anyone saying anything that goes contrary to God's Word, then everything else that they say should be questioned as well. In other words, if they've got one thing that's wrong, it's likely that there's some other things down there too. So the first key word that I'm going to give you is investigation. Investigation. Uh, John makes it clear that we can't believe, you can't believe everything you hear. And so you have to test everything to make sure that it comes from God. Now, I want to backtrack just a little bit here because John had already established the fact that there is a spirit that comes from God. And he, he made that uh, declaration back in uh, chapter 3, the last verse of chapter 3, uh, verse 24. And here's what he says. <clears throat> the one who keeps God's command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. <clears throat> so there is a spirit that comes from God. And we know that to be the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had talked about the Holy Spirit himself in John chapter 16. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So there are some roles there of the Holy Spirit. Listen, uh, Jesus goes on. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear it now. But when the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now in this passage, Jesus makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is coming after him. <clears throat> and that when the Holy Spirit comes, he would serve several roles in our lives. And those are still true today. Uh, we say that God lives in our heart. I talked to Cooper about that this morning. 
Jesus in your heart? Yes, Jesus in my heart. Well, actually, it's the Holy Spirit that indwells us. It's God through his Holy Spirit that lives within us. You are the dwelling place of God. That's the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. And so it's the Holy Spirit that we have in our lives today. Just from this passage that, that Jesus uh, talked about the Holy Spirit, we see that the Holy Spirit is here to help us and to convict us and to guide us and to teach us and to speak to us and to dwell within us. That's the Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. And it is by the Holy Spirit that we must judge everything else. So let's read uh, what John writes in this letter. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, we were just talking about the number of cult groups in the United States. And here in the very first century, as the first church, John is saying, listen, they're out there. They're out there. The command to not believe every spirit in, in this writing is in the present tense. It literally, literally means stop believing every spirit which indicates that there were some in the church who had begun to believe those things. They just accepted any teaching that came along. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I always caution folks. They, some folks, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, what about this book or what about this Bible study? I said, well, I hadn't seen that, but you've got to really be careful. Because there are a lot of things that you can get your hands on that have the word Bible on it that are not necessarily from God. And so it was going on in the first church. Uh, John was saying, stop believing everything you hear. Because not everything you can hear is necessarily from God. John's not saying, look out because they're coming. John is saying, look out because they're already here. It's already a problem, and it hadn't changed in 21 centuries. It's important to be skeptical when it comes to spiritual claims. Proverbs 4, 14, 15 says, a simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. So the false teachers don't go around wearing a nameplate that says, hi, I'm a false teacher. You have to test them. You have to consider carefully what it is that they stand for and what it is that they teach. The word test refers to examining and to proving and to scrutinizing in order to determine if it's genuine or not, if it's true or not, if it's faithful to God's word or not. Uh, this this uh, word to test is often used uh, to, de uh, to determine if a metal uh, or precious metals are real or not. You ever heard of fool's gold? Fool's gold? There's one gymnologist that writes, it's not unusual for a beginner to wonder about the difference between gold and other materials that are found in the same stream bed. Because shiny rocks or iron pirate, which is fool's gold, is mistaken for the real thing. In fact, there's a story of an entire shipload of this iron pyrite that was shipped to England during the 1500s. It was yellow stuff, and they thought it was gold, and they sent it to the king. So there's a lot of stuff that glitters in the name of spirituality that's not really from God. Uh, almost everything connected to God and truth has a counterpart in various forms of evil. Think about it. We have the Trinity. Who, who's the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, you have the devil, you have the Antichrist, and you have false prophets. Uh, 
we, we, Jesus gave us the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. We studied this in, on Wednesday night, not long ago. Uh, when they come up, they look very similar. The plant looks similar. And so someone had come in and scattered tares among the wheat. And so the question became, well, what do we do? Do we destroy the wheat trying to get rid of the tares? You have to wait. Uh, in contrast to angels, they're demons. Moses performed miracles from God. The Egyptian magicians copied those things. In the book of Acts, uh, Philip's miraculous signs were, were copied by Simon the sorcerer. You see, so almost every time that there's something that is good and true and valid, there's going to be something else that counters that. And so you have to be very careful. All that glitters is not gold. Did you know that every single New Testament writer warns about false teachers and false prophets? Now, if every one of them had something to say about it, and God was inspiring each one, then God knew that there was going to be a problem. And God wanted us to be prepared to face the reality of that problem. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 24, Watch out so that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. As John said, they're not coming. They're already here. So we need to be like uh, the believers from Berea. They're described in Acts chapter 17. Listen to what are, is said about the believers in Berea. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. I don't know if the Thessalonians like to hear that or not, but uh, that's what he said. Here's why. The Bereans received the message with great eagerness and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was actually true. You see, that, Paul was the apostle. Paul was a great evangelist. But these Bereans were wise enough to know you can't just take what somebody says for gospel truth. You've got to examine the scriptures to determine whether it's gospel truth or not. We need to be like the Bereans. The second key word <clears throat> that I want to give you is incarnation. And what, well, what this word uh, incarnation, you know it means, uh, it describes the fact that Jesus came uh, as God in the form of a human being. He was incarnate, God incarnate. And, and so this word incarnation should make you think to question what do they teach about the Savior? What, if you're evaluating this group, what do they teach about Jesus? If the group doesn't get their teaching about Jesus right, nothing else that they teach will be right either. Because <clears throat> we are all about Jesus. Look at verses uh, 2 and 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. There are a lot of folks who talk about God. Uh, our Mormons talk about Jesus, but to them, he's the half brother of Lucifer, he's a created being. The Jehovah Witness believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel archangel who became a man and then after the resurrection Jesus was just a spirit not real not a physical person Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet but was not God 
Christian scientists uh, teach that Jesus was a man in tune with his divine consciousness. The Baha'i uh, Baha faith believes that Jesus is only one of nine great world manifestations and is not the unique path to salvation. Unitarians believe that Jesus was a good man who was mistakenly deified by his followers. Uh, like Peter declared with hesitation, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that separates us from those who teach false doctrine. Any system that denigrates the deity of Christ or dishonors his humanity cannot be from God. Listen to these words from 2 Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift de destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute, disrepute. So, friends, we must test the spirit. We must not believe everything that comes down the pike. It's got to line up with what God's word teaches. The third word is regeneration. What does this group say about salvation, about regeneration? Now, let's look at verses 4 and 5. And we see that when we're saved, we become God's children. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. You, dear children, are not God. Are, excuse me. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. Came across the story of uh, the king of the jungle, this proud lion. He was walking through the jungle and came upon a little rabbit, and he demanded, roar, roar, demanded of the rabbit. Didn't mean to scare you, Charlie. You, got, you okay? Okay. He roars, and, and he, the rabbit jumps, and, and he says, who's the king of the jungle? And the rabbit bows his down, his ears flop down. He says, you are, O king. And so the lion continued down the path, and he came across a monkey, and he roared out the same question. Who's the king of the jungle? And the same answer was the same. Oh, you are, O king. Everybody knows that. So he came across this big old bull elephant. I mean, he was a monster. Had about six-foot tusk. And so the lion roared, who's the king of the jungle? The elephant reached down with his tusk and uh, with his trunk, grabbed that lion by the tail and swung him around a few times and let him go, and he slammed up against this big old tree. And as he's kind of staggering around there, uh, the lion said, well, just because you didn't know the answer, you didn't have to get up tight about it. <laughs> Listen, the devil is deceiving many people by saying that he is stronger, that he is wiser, that he's more interested in you than God is. But remember, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have people who will come against you. Uh, you're going to have difficulties in life. You're going to have questions, temptations. But remember who is in you. And the one who is in you by his Holy Spirit is greater than anything you're going to face in life. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. fourth key word is submission. 
does this group submit to the authority of God's word? Check out verse 6. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now, when John uses this, these words, we and us, he's referring to himself and the apostles. Uh, all those who are truly born again will accept the teaching of the apostles as we have it preserved in the New Testament. It's God's word. God inspired those men. God called those men. God used those men to preserve his word so that we could have it today. If you're not willing to say that God's word is true and it is the authority by which you live your life, then you're saying you don't believe in God. Because God's word is what determines how we're going to live. What we're going to stand for. What we're going to believe. It is the authority by which we live our lives. Those who know God, listen to God and his word. It is through his word that he reveals to us what he wants us to know. If you don't have time to study, to read, to meditate on what God is telling you in his word, you're saying to God, I ain't got time for you. What authority have you submitted your life to? In order to distinguish truth from falsehood, you must be submitted to the scriptures. Now, false teachers don't have a very high view of, of scripture. Uh, they'll either add additional books to help explain what they believe, or they'll simply ignore what the Bible teaches. You see, it's one thing to say, I appreciate the Bible, but it's another thing altogether to submit to the authority of God's word. You have to have your spiritual radar working all the time because there are folks who are going to try to influence your life. There are folks that are going to try to in, uh, infiltrate your thinking. There are folks who are going to try to infect you with things that are not spiritually good for you. The Bible often gets misquoted, misunderstood, ignored, and demeaned in our current state of affairs. And sometimes people believe things about the Bible that are simply not true. For example, <clears throat> did you ever hear anyone quote, quote <clears throat> did you ever hear anybody quote that scripture, the Lord helps those who help themselves? You know where that is in scripture? Well, I can't think of that verse right now. The fact is, it's not in Scripture. The fact is, the Lord helps those who cannot help themselves. That's the kind of God we got. So, when you're evaluating, something comes along, somebody invites you to a Bible study, or somebody wants to talk to you about something they've learned, or some new thought or philosophy, Investigation, incarnation, regeneration, submission, those words will help you to evaluate whether what you're looking at is from God or not. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to gather together to witness this testimony of faith by Cooper and to sing praises to your name and to lift up our prayers to you and to see your scripture and study your word and to hear your spirit speak to our hearts. So I pray in these moments, Lord, we might respond to you in appropriate ways as your spirit guides us. 
leads us, convicts us, teaches us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.